Hello everyone, Diego here of Farmer Veteran Coalition. We're back with another episode of Heroes of the Harvest. This episode is an exciting one because I had a chance to sit down and talk to our founder, Michael O'Gorman. He has over five decades of farming experience under his belt and has a lot to share about how he got started in organic farming. He started FSC back in 2009 and now offers classes to those who are interested in starting their own farm. I was able to learn a lot about him in the beginnings of FPC. He also offered valuable insight on how to scale up your farm, marketing your products, and finding opportunities in agriculture. From farming in the Bay Area to managing a farm in Mexico and starting an organization that we know today, Michael had a lot to talk about, and I'm excited to share it with you all. Enjoy. All right. Well, Michael, thanks for joining us on our podcast today. This is our third episode of Heroes of the Harvest. Um, yeah, why don't you, I'm sure all of our members know who you are, but why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Michael? I'm Michael O'Gorman. Um... I'm known as the uh, founder of uh, the Farmer Veteran Coalition. I also had a long career in agriculture. Um, my claim to fame in agriculture is I built three of the country's largest um, organic vegetable farms and um, companies with multiple farms. Um, I was the farmer in those companies, and uh, that was a real exciting part of my career. It lasted about um, uh, 20 years. But I began farming in 1970, and I'm still farming today. I spend half the year. I'm Right now, I'm about 100 feet outside the house I was born in, in a small house out back. Nice. My, my brother and sister-in-law live in the big house, and uh, he stayed on this farm for the last 50 years while I went and uh, farmed all over um, uh, many parts of California, Arizona, um, and four states in Mexico. Nice. And so you say you have over five decades of experience in agriculture, correct? Uh, yes, yeah. Five, 54 years. This is my 54th year or so. Yeah, I got some, uh, my brother and there I, we, between us, we have 100 years between us. So, how did it all start? <laughs> you know, it's this looking for something meaningful to do. That's the same thing that we find with the veterans. You know, there's something that uh, you look and you think and you go, what What am I going to do that's this meaningful? And also, what am I going to do that, um, mm -hmm. you know, gives me the satisfaction, uh, makes me feel good at the end of the day? And, um, you know, the idea of being a farmer was kind of in our blood a little bit. My father um, passed away uh, in 2016. At the time, he was the oldest member of the Farmer Veteran Coalition. He was 100 years old. And uh, he, he came back from World War II wanting to become a farmer for the same reason that um, many men and women <laughs> who served in Iraq and Afghanistan come home and want to farm. And uh, for all the same reasons, he came up and found this beautiful piece of land in Northern California, uh, got his extended family together, uh, tried things out a little bit, but, um, you know, he had a, uh, was building a family. He eventually had seven kids and uh, couldn't figure out how to um, make a living doing it and went back to te teaching school. But um, it was in the blood. It was in the um, our DNA. My brother and I both became... Uh, farmers and you mentioned so even back then the reasons are still the same even compared to nowadays you'd say the reasons for our veterans getting to agriculture would be the same as for example your father my my father used to come up to the farm in the summers you know because the farm re, re, remained in the family as kind of the place where the that where the family coalesced a lot of us a lot of us uh moved various times during our lives our kids uh, I've lived in a number of different places and, uh, the farm was always uh, the gathering point for the greater family. And my father would come up here every summer way into his nineties. And the first thing you do after throwing the doors open of the pickup or the, I mean, the car, he drove a car, I drive pickups. Um, he'd jump out and recite the first, um, uh, paragraphs of uh, Thoreau's uh, Walden, you know, and talking about, uh, um, you know, I came to the woods to live deliberately and uh, front only the essential things of life so that um, when I die, I will not find that I have not lived. And, and uh, um, that was just his belief that jump in, appreciate the beauty of life, appreciate nature, do something important, do something helpful. Yeah. and do something 
with the land and it touched all those and it touched our whole family. So, so tell me about your journey through farming. Tell me different places that you've done. Well, I started farming in, uh, uh, 71. I, actually my first, my first, uh, one acre garden was farm was in, um, New Mexico in 1969. Uh, that's where I met my, uh, who was going to become my wife and the mother of my four children. And, um, in 1971, we were part of something called the back to the land movement. And, um, uh, a lot of people, uh, knew us as hippies, but we were kind of a, an ambitious sort. And, and we were part of a community that, that, um, uh, was going to grow its own food. And so I was part of that, um, uh, at a very young age, just because of, uh, I guess I had some natural leadership and, um, and desire to farm i i was in charge of um, growing the food and feeding the community there for for a, a number of years um after that i spent some time back on the farm here with my brother in the 80s but a chance came up in um uh, 86 um i think that was my one job i applied for in the last uh, 50 years cuz uh, after that every time i um you know people be- after a while, when you farm, people knock on your door, asking, "Will you come work for them?" And uh, but there was a opportunity in uh, Livermore, about an hour east of the San Francisco in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, running a farm teaching Southeast Asians how to farm. With and um, I called up and got the job and went down. Um, the nonprofit dropped the project partway through my time there and I took over and ran that farm for a couple of years. And then in 1990 I got a phone call um a young man well younger than me at the time um who said he was going to start the first organic farm in Salinas, California. And if anybody knows about farming, Salinas uh, vegetable farming, Salinas is like uh, getting called up to Salinas is like getting called up to the major leagues for sure. And probably the Yankees, you know, so getting tapped to go farm in Salinas. So, so, uh, I went that and, and, uh, for the next, um, um, seven years, I pioneered, uh, the, the enormous growth of the organic industry, but also specifically the growth of the, um, salad mixes, you know, where we went, went to, um, Japan, went to Europe, got seeds. We developed, figured out how to grow this stuff on a large scale commercial level. And, uh, um, you know, by the time we were done, we were shipping, you know, a dozen or more semis a day um, across the country of um, salad mix and getting it in every store and supermarket and becoming known for really, really, really adding a lot of stuff to the uh, new options of things to eat and grow. So back then, how was it getting to organic at the time? You said it was like a big deal. Is it as like, was it as popular as back then? I was always interested in organic farming and I actually studied organic farming in 1969. I took my, my one university level class I sat in on. I didn't get credits, but I sat in on a class um, at University of California in Berkeley on organic farming and it was a real new concept and uh, uh you know so i studied i you know i got all the rodale books um farming in tennessee we tried to be as organic as we could but um there was not as many tools what i call tools there weren't effective organic sprays there weren't uh, um as affordable organic fertilizers there were no rules saying this you're organic or not. And so there really wasn't a market developed. Todd Coons, who started the TKO Farms, he looked at a lot of, he went to different farms and looked to see who's managing a, you know, a false, a small, small farm, but is ready to go big time. And, and uh, he came and tapped me and said, I want, you know, I said, why'd you pick me? He said, I want you, you know, you're the, you're the guy you know, that I think you can do this. And so it was, a, you know, the uh, another thing that happened out of that. So the demand for organics went through the roof. At the same time, uh, 1990 was when the uh, Organic Foods Act was passed. The organic standards were set and, and what and the rules 
governing what qualified you to be an organic grower, what you could use, what you couldn't use, you know, the inspection process and uh, things like that passed. So there was, um, there was demand and there was support and there was rules now. And they, but mostly they just needed somebody that, that was uh, interested in it, uh, believed in it and was willing to, um, um, you know, stick their neck out and, and try it. And so at that time, you know, we were, I took organics. There was one other um, company that in the organic vegetable industry that was, um, you know, kind of simultaneous parallel to us called Cal Organics, but our, our company TKO Farms. And then I went to Earthbound, which became uh, when they became a, um, went big, they hired me to run their organic production. So these companies were were there and ready for the growth. So it was a, it was an exciting time. It was a real exciting time because um, I would say everybody was watching us and watching what we were doing and the interest and um, uh, really paved the way for a lot of other companies to to get in in a big way and uh, put organics on the table. Yeah. And so afterwards, what was next after that? I'd done a, a couple of things, uh, particularly when I was with Earthbound a little bit with TKO, and, the, and then with Earthbound, I had gone down a few times to um, to do some um, production in Mexico. I was also involved in some of the first organic production in Mexico, particularly in the Sinaloa Valley, which is where uh, Mexico is a lot produces a lot of the um, tomatoes and peppers, uh, eggplant, cucumbers, a lot of the real warm season crops in in the winter time for for the u.s and mexico so it's really really enormously important agricultural area and i i i had a farm down there that was one of the first one of two side by side um, first organic farms in sinaloa and i was doing that and i thought that's kind of a fun adventure you know i'd worked with primarily with um, spanish-speaking workers of Mexican descent in in my production in those companies. I had hundreds of employees, 500, uh, one company up to 1,000 at the next company. And uh, um, it was, you know, I thought this would be fun. So I I um, uh, took a job with Del Cabo, Jacobs Farm Del Cabo, um, started the um, very early on successful farming co-op in this very southern tip of Baja, um, focusing on um, high value crops because the farmers in that area had small parcels of land. So they focused on fresh basil and um, different categories of, of cherry tomatoes. We call just the small tomato category, which includes at the time, red cherry, um, the, the sun gold, the little orange, um, very sweet um, cherry tomato and red and yellow pears. And then over time, grape tomatoes and many other colors and variations began. And um, they had started that business and um, asked me if I would be willing to go to the northern half of the Baja Peninsula and put together production so they could stay, um, have year-round production and grow their market and so um i said yes and um it was uh it was a fun time it was a fun time to build build something from scratch um you know just put together what became the company's largest growing region and um converted a lot of land into organics so after your time in mexico i'm assuming um fec farmer brand coalition came next oh yeah yeah, so, so you know, eleven years of building this company in Mexico, and I really, uh, you know, that's kind of a my length of staying with something. You know, not being the owner, uh, building something that somebody else owns, and and um, you know, it just felt like the uh, people there in Mexico, the administrative crew I had, everything was pretty much. Hey, you guys can do this, you know. So we so we talked a lot for the owners about, you know, finding time for my transition. You know, a couple of things led to the idea. 
And, uh, um, but, you know, most people think about veterans in agriculture and they think of, oh, this is a great thing for the veterans. But in my mind, I was thinking, well, this, this is a great thing for, for agriculture because our number one issue is, is becoming after, after several centuries of farming getting more and more uh, equipment and mechanization and technology growing and farms becoming um, more efficient and the percentage of people farming going down and down and down over the years it just got too low it just got too far down that the the average age of the farmer was getting too old the amount of kids that went, the second generation that went, you know, that's a real up and down income. You're always at risk. The hours are incredible. It's this little town. I'd like to move out to a bigger city. I'd like to raise my kids in the suburb or I'd like to go enjoy life, uh, you know, uh, closer to uh, cultural events or whatever they were interested in. And so, we were really facing a crisis, and we still are, in um, needing more what I call human capital in agriculture. So, so I really saw this as a as a twofer, yeah. and I really thought what I would be most doing would be working with a small number of veterans and teaching them vegetable production. Um, but the concept, the idea, it's hard. It's hard for people to realize that. Now, from the perspective of Farmer Veteran Coalition closing in on 50,000 members, you know, every, uh, every major agricultural group in every state, you know, has programs to uh, help veterans, you know. Um, and the, the USDA is a strong commitment to help veterans in agriculture. But at the time, Nobody was making the connection. There was no zero connection to the point that where probably the first 50, 100, 200 people, everybody I told when they, when they said, you know, friends and acquaintances in the farming industry, family, everybody, when they said, what are you going to do next? I said, well, I have this different idea. I'm going to help veterans become farmers. Everybody had almost word for word the, the exact same response. They were like, wow, how come no one thought of that? You know, and I thought, yeah, it seems an yeah. obvious thing, but it wasn't. It was not happening. There was no connection. And so it was, an ex it was a, once again, that thing I like to do is start something that isn't there and make it. And um, so, so there was, I mean, it still is an exciting project this day, but you know, that those, those early moments of introducing, you know, the, the country um, and our farming community to this concept and, and almost kind of a, almost kind of an electrified response to it, you know, that, well, this is really, really, really a neat thing. And uh, um, we're there. Were there people who were like skeptical of the idea too, like a little hesitant to get behind it? I can't think of anybody that said it was. Everybody thought it was a great idea. Um, you know, we did have a moment when the USDA. You know, one of the things that I was able to do was to get uh, support for the veterans at the USDA, uh, written into mm -hmm. the Farm Bill, and um, you know, so. The first the first year where veterans were written into the beginning farmer and rancher, you know, the BFRDP program, and uh, we applied for it. And our grant was turned down, and the reviewers, reviewers had very skeptical things. And one of them was, um, you know, veterans... We know they can handle the stress. We don't. How how do we know the veteran can hang, handle the stress of farming? I'm going mm -hmm. after combat. You know, mm -hmm. another reviewer said, "Yeah, it's, it's you know, suicide rates are so high. What this? I don't think this is a good 
investment. You know, we might lose these people. And I, we, so, so I actually went all the way to Secretary Vilsack. The Secretary of Agriculture now was the Secretary of um, Agriculture when when Farmer Veteran Coalition launched and was was really our earliest supporter and advocate and um, began, you know, I gave a speech in Washington, D.C. in 2008 um, to a coalition, coalition for Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, a coalition of over 50 veteran groups that we were made part of. And they had a, a government partners day and a whole, you know, senior leadership from the USDA came over to listen to the talk. And, uh, and uh, they, they went and met with Vilsack the next day and word for words out of my speech, you know, but which was, you know, the um, all voluntary military post nine eleven is all voluntary and how it comes the enormously disproportionate number now come from our rural communities. You know, the more rural, mm -hmm. the, the higher the number. And that's where we need the farmers. And so, so Vilsack yeah. became just almost like a stump speaker for the cause. And, you know, every time he went to speak someone, he would mention, you know, the wanting to help, uh, help this project and, and help the veterans become uh, farmers. And so it's, uh, uh, I, I would say the support for it was tremendous. Very, very, very little skepticism and, and, uh, um, you know, very patriotic in the sense that, you know, people yeah. wanted to, felt like they wanted to do something. And, but also like, um, I think that, I think that the biggest advocates for FEC, what I learned was, you know, tell the story of a veteran, you know, and made the story real simple. But, you know, I would tell my, you know, uh, you know social media, media, everything else. Here's the story is very simple. Here is a veteran he or she, and uh, joined the military, say, after high school or after 9-11, went to Iraq or Afghanistan or any somewhere else, came back, and here they are with tomatoes or pigs or chickens. Here they are, and now they're farming. And it tells a story. Of, it's optimistic. It's positive. It's feel good. It's, it's, it's you know, it's a transformation. It's photogenic. And it, it's a real simple storyline, but it just caught the imagination. And I think it caught the imagination of a generation of veterans because there's a, you know, there's just been so many have taken to it. And, uh, um, you know, you know, I, we would repeat that story, but, um, in all its different iterations and, and, uh, um, it felt good and it felt positive and it felt hopeful. And, um, I, I feel like it's lived up to it. Oh yeah, absolutely. On one hand, I can understand like being concerned that like the stress of farming can be too much for the veteran, but yeah. from all the stories I've heard and all of the people that I've met working for FEC, it just makes sense. Like it just seemed like farming was just such a good fit for them because Again, like it, it helps with stress. It's it's slow, like gives them a more slow down kind of lifestyle. Um, a lot of the, the uh, skills I learn in the military can be transferred onto the onto the farm. Oh, absolutely! It, like you said, it's just a sense of pride, like getting all that hard work done at the end of the day. Absolutely, and you know, the early on, it was one of the veterans themselves that that I, I that got my attention because they I said something and they said something. They said, "Michael, we didn't go in the military because it was easy. We went in because it was yeah. hard, and that's why we want to farm because it's hard. And because if it was yeah. easy, it wouldn't be as rewarding, you know. And so, a combination of physical and mental." strength that you have to you have to um you know some unknown some uncertainty some risk um but yes you know it it, it has a it in that sense that you know what what we found early on is that the two things 
that, and sometimes it gets confused. Sometimes PTSD gets confused with a lot of different things, just kind of like a, uh, you know, sometimes people found themselves a little lost after the military, particularly if uh, um, it was such a, a meaningful and seminal time of their life. So it, we realized that the two things that were really missing from the military was number one, that sense of purpose. And the second thing was the camaraderie. And that's what we found is, and particularly, you know, when we found that, you know, looking at, you know, the addresses of the people that were joining FEC, the number two, the two top addresses were Rural Route and uh, C- County Road. And, uh, you know, so everybody's moving out and far away from people, you know, small towns and uh, away from some of the veteran services so that we found that the camaraderie that the veterans built, the friendships they built, getting to know other people who are farming, you know, that's why our conferences became so uh, dynamic because people liked, uh, you know, I'm I'm way out here, you know, doing the you're raising pastured poultry, and you're over there. How are you doing it? You know, and people became friends and 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 got in touch with each other and support each other. So so those that camaraderie and that sense of purpose, um, really mission driven feeling that that people got from being involved is 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 really gone really gone far. So how many years did you spend at FEC before? doing what you do now i think it was 12 years 12 years of running fec so yeah um, so tell me about your current venture yes well so you know i'm 75 years old i don't feel it i don't think of it i think of myself as that and uh, you know a lifetime of farming and doing things i just that um retirement just isn't really something I'm really looking at, you know, and I'm passionate. So there's two parts of a, a couple parts of what I'm doing. And one was, um, um, my brother had some, had, still has some health issues where he would have to go down to the San Francisco Bay area, um, for treatment, um, one week a month. And, uh, so when I stepped away from leading FEC, I thought, well, I can come in and, go up and help you help the farm while you're gone, you know, and um, came up here and realized, Hey, this is the land I was born on. I have my ties here, you know, my, my kids, uh, my kids and my siblings all love coming up here. Uh, my grandkids. And um, so this will be my fifth year where I'm spending six months helping my brother on his farm. Um, the other thing I'm doing is anything I could do to help um, um, new and beginning farmers. And it seems like, uh, you know, the, particularly there's a lot, lot, lot of groups and a lot of efforts to train new farmers. So I've begun doing classes on primarily around vegetable production and running your farms uh, like a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and I began working with, um, uh, Randy Ryan, he's a longtime FEC member, one of our earliest members. Um, he spent the many years running the country's largest um, uh, school garden project, built it to over 500 schools, um, and uh, grew up farming and uh, Army veteran. And so uh, I'm having him help, and we've been doing classes. We've been going uh, a couple of weeks ago. We went and spent uh, most of a week in Hawaii with uh, uh, Emily Emmons' group there, and and uh, we've been doing some online. Done with the Rodale Institute in June. I'll we'll be I'll be going to uh, Louisiana and uh, giving a number of classes there, um, and. Uh, also doing some one-on-one mentoring, um, particularly with um, farmers or veterans and farmers that want to transition to organics and helping them. Pretty much sticking to things I want to do that are fun. But I love teaching farming and I love teaching about vegetable production, how to build your farm, how to scale your farm. There's a yeah. one that's real popular too, you know. 
how to how to take a farm from from this level to whichever level you want to go because that was kind of a um the skill set that i learned how to do in my career i'm glad you brought that up too because i did want to ask you about one of your classes scaling your farm so tell me about that how, how does one begin with that well we get asked that a lot uh diego for you know the um I know the group in Louisiana have asked me and they said, every, you know, people, a lot of, uh, farms have, you know, with, uh, you say a couple of years ago when COVID hit, you know, at first it was a scary time because people were losing markets, right. You know, if they were selling to uh, restaurants, you know, restaurants were shutting down. If they were selling the schools, the schools were shutting down, you know, people were losing, losing markets or losing opportunity, but the, but the farmers, including our veteran farmers, who who were able to um, sell something locally, you know, with the food chain kind of breaking down a little bit, um, price, demand going up, and people wanting something fresh, and uh, people wanting something, you know, securing something and getting something for local, the the demand all of a sudden went up, you know. But um, there's a, there's a lot of um, there's a lot to put into a plan to scale your farm. People think of the big things. They think of producing more. They think of selling more. They think of, uh, of um, you know, those things. But there's, you know, there's 50 little things that make, uh, uh, that make your operation uh, be able to to scale. Those are some of the things we focus on. You know, I like to focus a lot on. Um, I teach a lot about productivity, which is what you're producing per time for your time, and yield, which is what you're producing for space. And uh, we go through a lot of uh, mention a lot of that in class. But we also talk about like if you want to scale and go into the wholesale market, and the wholesale may be just a small chain, or it may be bringing to restaurants, or it may be, you know, uh, a larger distributor. And, and uh, you know, how do you, how do you plan your farm very differently, you know, to satisfy a, a buyer who has to, uh, who, who has a big responsibility to um, create a steady supply of things. And so we talk about ex- extending your season, we talk about product line extension, which is like carrying more than one item. You know, if you're going to do tomatoes, you know, carrying a line of tomatoes so that so that the buyer, your whether it's a supermarket or uh, or or a restaurant that you're bringing there, they could you could supply the, their tomato needs by having the different types of tomatoes they want. And so, so it really goes through the um, the basics and. The, the interesting thing is that, you know, these are concepts that I put into my own practice and was able to to scale farms, um, uh, you know, at a kind of a mega rate, but but they but they work at it. Uh, they work on smaller levels. It's the same. And I'm very, you know, very mathematical and how I look at farming, you know, one of my talks is the mathematics of successful vegetable farming. So I like to break it down into concepts that, um, you know, I say, even if it sounds simple, get your mind thinking on this so that, because it'll get more complicated as you build it. But uh, yeah, scaling's a, scaling is really a fun, a fun thing, you know, because you grow, you're a farmer, you grow, you like growing things, but it's growing Growing your business is another dimension. So you're growing these crops, but you also you want yeah. to grow your business. You want to you want to be do this much this year and and that much next year, and and uh, it's a lot of um, um, goal setting and and uh, learning what's possible and and um, and going for it. So when it comes to growing your business, what are some different ways? That they can market their business as they're trying to, you know, scale up. Yeah, when I was a smaller grower, I loved restaurants because the restaurant actually use a lot of produce, and um, you know, so yeah. um, lettuces, tomatoes, 
um, restaurants are restaurants are fun. They'll buy, they buy regularly, you know, um, um, and they want, you know, every chef in the country now wants to have some connection with, with, with farmers and, and who's producing their stuff and some identity in, in their store and stuff. So restaurants are a great business. Um, another time, another one is, you know, it's a kind of a little next level, but looking for that small, it could be an one independent grocer, but it also could be like a small chain of groceries. A lot of towns say, and it seems like I've played in different places because, um, I know around San Diego, I know uh, different places I've lived, there's small chains, like three or four or five stores that are related. And uh, um, and just working with a, a, a smaller chain, you know, that's kind of a next level, you know. But you want to, um, the thing right now is the opportunity. It's uh, just, it's hard not to... Uh, it's hard to over pitch the opportunity right now because it's now cost so much to, you know, your production moved to California for its efficiencies, for this availability of water in the summer without rain. So you could fight disease more easily. Um, the availability of labor and the somewhat inexpensive cost of shipping across the country and packaging, but now packaging, uh, you know, the box that you, vegetables come in and the cost of shipping from one end of the country are so high that, um, and on one end, so you're saving those costs when you're local and you're getting a premium because you're local and people want something fresh and something good and exciting and want to know you. So it's made the math work now for for a farm there's an opportunity for a you know a, a two acre or a 10 acre or a 20 acre or a 50 acre you know vegetable uh, or fruit producer to um to make a living and to uh, you know and uh, um, and find these new markets and so i think that um i think it's a exciting time and um uh and people are looking for it and so and then what about like um, like purchasing or leasing a property, how does that work in regards to scaling or any advice you give someone pros and cons maybe? You know, the, it's interesting because there's a, um, one of the, a veteran that we worked with very early on that went on and had a very successful business. He spoke at our FBC conferences once or twice over the years. And, um, he runs locally laid eggs in Minnesota. And he told me one time the biggest mistake he made was took all his money and bought property. Uh, when now his business is, he has his eggs, but you know he's really like he's found all these other producers, including a number of Amish families that'll produce the eggs, and he markets, he cleans them and markets them, and he's built that business so. So yes, you know the uh, if people have an opportunity, that, you know with you know the fortunate ones inherit some land or have some family land, um, but interestingly, the three farms I managed, we didn't own any of it. The companies didn't own any of it. It was all leased. People say, well, what about a lease? You know, they're gonna. Uh, you know, drop you after a while or something that people didn't drop working with me either. They liked that we took care of their land, that I maintained a relationship with them. So, so I, I think, you know, that not only land, not owning land does not need to be an obstacle to someone's desire to farm. And so there's a lot of, you know, I like to, I like people to look at a, the range of options, you know, half the farmers in the U S hold a day job um, and some of those that hold whose day job is farming some of those who are farmers like me technically don't didn't even make the list of who was a farmer because that's just because I wasn't reporting the income so so there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity 
And um, that's what, and that's the the joy. That's the fun I have is helping people figure out their path. And when I give these classes, what I like, the fun part is follow up. You know, we always say, you know, Hey, afterwards, you know, and that's where Randy helps me too. You got questions you want to follow up and talk to me about your specific farm. Then, then uh, we'll set up a 30 minute call with me and, and we can talk to you about, you know, what, what you want to do on your place. And that's, I think that's a good segue too, to my next question is again, opportunities in agriculture and employment. Would you say a good place to start is like maybe asking someone if they need help around the farm, if they're hiring, how would, how would they get that first step, you know, into agriculture? Um, well, I, every, every farm is begging for people, you know, I mean, that's, there's, there's a labor mm-hmm. shortage. Um, there's, uh, if you're not sure and you want to do it and you're not pressed for income, I would find a farm that, and go volunteer and volunteer a day or two a week, you know, or, or see and then, and see if he is, but I would also like find a local farm. And I think, I think, I think you're, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities there to learn farms. So there, there's, there's apprentice programs and things, but I think the, the greatest way to learn is to work for somebody else you know because it doesn't it doesn't preclude you from getting to farm on your own you know sometimes sometimes there's even you know you you may even find that you're working for a farmer of any type of scale and uh, after a while on learning learning the learning the trade i like to say learn farming as a trade you know everyone teaches it as a business and i kept saying you know it's a trade, you know, it's a set of skills and that's what the skills are needed. Anybody that gets and you're not going to get all the skills, but, you know, those skills that you can apply to help us uh, grow food are going, are going to be, they're going to be in demand. But I think the best training is to work for a, a, a for-profit farm and see how they do it, you know, because it, there's going to be a certain pace about it and there's going to be a certain, um, striving constant striving for efficiency and uh that you're going to be learning about both those things you know that that pace and that efficiency and while learning the the uh, uh what it takes to grow the crop and the people that you talk to during your classes people that you like give advice to are they usually um produce farmers or are they like a wide range no. like livestock all kinds no, my classes are, you know, they, 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 the concepts apply to anything type of farming. You know, mm-hmm. I, obviously there's a level of training that I could do a little more finesse with somebody in the produce industry, but, but I think that the concepts are really applicable, you know, the concepts of scaling. Um, I think that you can, you know, say there would be very parallel, you know, I love questions and answers and try to apply that, you know to that concept. Yeah. So that's one of the things, the joys of, of, of running the farmer veteran coalition is I got to see other parts of agriculture that I didn't really know a lot about, you know, and, the, and it's a, it's a beautiful yeah. thing. All the, you know, the, what the country does to feed itself. And What's the most um, unique farm you've seen during your time at FEC? I loved seeing the, you know, the, the pigs and chickens, you know, I think if I was starting all over, I would get into more into animals than I did, you know, uh, you know, so I, I love seeing that those different aspects of, uh, of, um, uh, of farming. Um, a lot of veterans have gone into that, that animal production, you know, but I think it's a, it's an exciting thing and it's an exciting thing to be around. And, uh, um, so I think like the poultry, both with the meat birds and the eggs, um, I'm going to love fresh eggs, you know. So when I started FEC, I thought of fresh vegetables, but eggs, it wasn't something you know, I thought I put fresh in front of, you know, it was just something, I'm just going to go buy eggs, you know, I'm not thinking that fresh eggs, are, you know, are going to be better, you know, but but it's wonderful. Anything that you, any advice that you give to any of our members listening to our podcast that Compared to someone who has um, experience to someone who doesn't, how would the advice differ for our members? 
you know, I think if someone's got experience, uh, you know, I think it's like, um, take, you know, take a little, you know, you got a partner, a wife, a husband, you know, a family, you know, you need to take into consideration what they want to do too, you know, but I think, you know, the, uh, uh, is growth, um, important to you because it's not for everybody. My brother's been happy with the same 20 acres for 50 something years. And, and he's, you know, doesn't do things a lot differently than he did back then. You know, I wasn't me, you know, if I had, you know, if I had 50 acres one year, I needed the hundred the next year. It was just, it was just who I was, you know? And, um, so I think that, I think you got to balance your, you, you got to merge your, um, you know, your farming interests with a, a sense of where you want to go and where you want to be, you know, did you want to just be a really good farmer on a, a small acreage or do you want to hit the ball long, you know, for someone starting out, I would say, you know, think of farming as a trade, think of it as a trade, because if you th focus on learning the skills, you will be in demand and everybody for the rest of your life, you will be in demand. And, uh, um, and I think that, you know, people are going to tell you to think about business and, and, um, you know, cash flow and spreadsheets and stuff, but it's the trade of farming that, 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 that's needed out there. And that, and in particularly if you're, you know, if you're versatile enough, you know, if you're flexible enough in your, your plan, you know, that, um, that I think a lot of opportunity can come your way. You know, if you, you know, if you don't get too set too early on, this is exactly what I'm going to do, you know, good for you. If that, if that, if you know what that is and, and pull it off. But I think that, I think that there's a lot of, um, um, those first few years and stuff, there's a lot of, um, uh, just the experience of farming, the experience of the work and the, and that work outside and, and, um, the, you know, what, finding what you get pleasure from and, and what your interest is, is real important. And I believe that's about all the time we have today for this episode. Um, any final thoughts you'd like to share, Michael, anything you'd like to say? I'm just saying, you know, go for it as a time for you, you know, if there's ever been a time, uh, for new farmers, you know, historically, you know, the U S has just given birth to farmers. It's like farmers had hope that some of their children would become farmers and that's where we got our farmers. And so there's a, the concept of, of coming into the industry, um, is new. It's not easy. It is not a one simple path, but it's a, if there's ever been a time for it, that's right now. And, um, and I don't think that's going to go away. I think it's, uh, I think that's only going to increase the, the demand, uh, um, for people willing to, you know, get up before sunrise and go out and put your boots on and go out and grow some food is, um, you know, it's not going to go away. Couldn't think of a better way to cap off another episode of Heroes of the Harvest. I had a great time speaking with our founder, Michael, and learning about his experiences in farming. I hope you learned a lot about how FC got started and are able to take something away from the various talking points I had with Michael, such as growing your business, how to market your products, and scaling up. For those interested in learning more about the classes that Michael has to offer, visit michaelgormanfarming.com. We also plan on having a webinar with Michael in the future about how to scale up your farming operation, so please be on the lookout for that. As always, thank you for listening and please share this with anyone who you think would benefit from this. You can find us on Spotify and on our YouTube channel. To stay up to date with what the FEC has going on, follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and make sure you sign up for our monthly newsletter. I also quickly want to say congratulations to all the recipients for this year's fellowship fund, and thank you to all of our funders. We were able to award 111 applicants and give out over $350,000 to very well-deserving farmer veterans. To learn more about the fellowship fund and how you can be involved, visit our website at farmbeco.org. Thank you again and see you next time.